welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders across Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down with Special Areas Board Advisory Councillor Erica Tessier. But before we do that, I have a quick request. Our other show, The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work, is looking for the top municipal news stories from across Canada of 2023. We are looking for the biggest political moves, the biggest municipal shakeups, or even the biggest municipal fumbles of 2023. Now, if you have a story in mind that you believe was the biggest news story municipally, message us today. We want to see what you were watching and reading this year. Either visit crossborderinterviews.ca and click on the Political Trenches tab to submit your news now or message us directly. Now, on to our interview. Erica, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with sort of a simple question, but it's a general question of what this whole show is about. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? I would immediately say my parents, um, you know, my first memories are of kinsmen and cadets and the parties and events and the volunteer activities they did. Dad would make us go to Knights of Columbus and sell the little snapped 50 fifties. And like, you know, then dad's or sorry, then mom was on school board. And then later dad was on town council. Like they were always a part of their community and a part of their organization. So when I moved to Oyen, that was just what you did. You got on the curling boards. That's how I met almost all the people that I knew was through the curling committee there. And, you know, you just, you got to put your time in or else nothing happens there. So, so it begs the question, um, where was your dad a town councillor? Where was your mom a school board trustee? So both, uh, my husband and I grew up in Kindersley, Saskatchewan. So not very far away. Um, and I came to Oyen because I interviewed for a job. And I said, oh, it's funny that Oyen has a Catholic school. And I lived an hour away my whole life, and I didn't know that. And they're like, would you live there? <laughs> I was like, are you offering me a job? And so that's how I came here. I'm like, oh, I'll just stay one or two years. It was close to home. And then I was going to leave around 2010 and do my master's. And then um, my dad, yeah, just life sort of throws things at you, and you have to make a change. So I, uh, who knew my husband's dream home was north of Sibold? Because I didn't. So I left for about a year and then we found this piece of land and here we are. So you decide in 2021 to f put your name forward for election for special areas boards. Now, correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, because um, I, I've tried to do a little bit of research on people, but this is the first election you decide to put your name forward in, correct? Yes. What was the decision for you to put your name forward in that 2021 election? So prior to that, I had been getting, I was paying attention, trying to keep my Twitter, you know, unbiased. And so I had lots of different issues coming to my attention, keeping track of the news. And I would always be calling uh, Nate at the time. He's our MLA. And he was always so good about, you know, if it wasn't him, it was his assistant at the time, James, talking me through things or letting me talk and rant. And and I just was starting to feel really like, you know, as great as a listener as Nate is, is that I couldn't, I don't know, I just felt really stuck in my in my spot, but I didn't know what else to do. And, you know, I was also, in, I'm teaching, I'm a teacher. And then you're kind of, when you teach remote rural, like it's, it's a passionate issue for me, you're kind of stuck, like, Every year you might get a new job. You never get to be the best grade five teacher you want to be. You're going to be this and this next year. You're going to do this and this. So I was getting just really frustrated with the systems I was in. And I saw that the, you could put your name forward. And I was like, oh, I'm too busy. I can't do it. And, and then I was talking with, we have a really phenomenal lady, um, Wanda Dyko. She's the economic uh, development guru here. And she she was like, you really should. You should really think about it. You should take it on. And more people talking about things that are, and I was like, okay, I'll think about it. And I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> it was a Sunday night. And I said, you know, this will be one of those things that if I don't do it, I will regret not doing it. And I, I really didn't think, I thought I was just participating in democracy. I, you know, the candidate before me or the advisory council member before me was two terms in. I just really didn't, but kind of forget that it's just such a tiny 
bubble. Like my special area is three subdivision four is a small number of people. And then that year, the election had, if we were rural, we had to apply for a vote to Senate and you had to mail the ballot in that Senate vote that year. So a lot of our ratepayer neighbors kind of didn't even realize they had to go to town to vote. So it was a very close election, like 29 to 25. That's like one. No, it was. So you've brought up a few things that I sort of want to sort of pose the question about because okay. you, you, you come from a political family. Your father's a town councillor, but town councillor and a special, a special areas board advisory councillor are two different things. So prior to putting your name forward, I'm assuming you had followed municipal politics. I'm assuming you had known what the issues were. But when you're dealing with an unincorporated community that is sorely the responsibility of the province, but is run by special advisory council members like yourself and a chairperson like Jordan Christensen, did you know and understand the structure of what a special areas board was prior to putting your name forward? <laughs> I did not. And it is quite a structure. Um, you know, you don't want to generalize, but you're like, well, you know, the roads, <laughs> you find out that it is quite, there are just so many things going on. I learned, I love it too, because you're learning so many different things. Like, you know, you're in, in a water, a committee for the, the water, and then you're in a committee for, uh, grasslands conservation. Like you're in like two, there's just so many things going on. So no, I did not understand the, uh, the structure uh, or even know. And I think that's part of my role now is like, oh, there's so many things going on and sharing that information and trying to, trying to, I don't know, tell people about things. You, they didn't well, know. And as a teacher, your background being a teacher, do you find yourself, and I, I hate to use the word educating, but do you, do you find yourself sort of informing the general public about the role of an advisory council member for a special areas board when you're talking to your residents? Because the issues that the average municipality deals with are probably similar, but not exactly similar to what's going on at your council table. So how do you see your role as an advisory council member in sort of addressing the issues, but addressing them with uh, the, uh, what's the word I want to say, residents as well? Yeah, so when... You know, a lot of our of our ratepayers are so good at advocating for themselves. A lot of times they'll call straight to the source. They know who to call, you know, and then uh, so they I've had, a, you know, I've, I have a few people bringing things to my attention, calling me to see them around. But as I find sometimes, too, as a teacher, I don't see people as other counselors might driving up and down the road or or farming. I'm in town every day. And so for me, I try to connect when I can and go to the things when I can. But I also, um, I think part of it is sharing the information that, what I always found helpful when I would call Nate was that he would give me the whole picture. He would give me the bigger, the bigger perspective and all the different sides of it. Whereas I could only, I could only feel one side. And so for me, it's too, it's bringing that perspective. Like, you know, when we're talking about different issues that, all the pictures like this couldn't happen if we didn't compromise here. So bringing, bringing, bringing the information in and giving it back at the same time. So I just try to relay what I can and then support questions and, and know who the professionals are that I can redirect. And, and I've learned like so much, like with a lot of the issues coming up, right? Like you've got all the renewables and all the different new things that we're all experiencing for the first time. We're going to be talking about the issues here in a few minutes, but I want to stick on the role as you as the advisory council, if you don't mind for a second. And I want to sort of ask you the, sort of the simple question, but the million dollar question. You, you've been in this role for two years now. You've just passed two years in October of 2023 as of recording this two years. Um What's been the biggest eye-opening experience? Because you you just said about the learning curve that you had to talk deal with. What what was the biggest eye-opening experience when you got sworn in? When you sat behind that council table and you started to need to make those decisions? What was the moment of going, "Whoa, this is a lot bigger than I my own little subdivision in special areas three? 
Yeah, I uh, even when you sit around uh, the council table, right? There's 12 people there from different regions and bringing their different issues and like their different complications. And, and so really being a good listener, like an active listener and trying to think about about it through through that lens like um and not and I think that's any elected position you, you're not there you're there for your neighborhood but you're not there only for your neighborhood right and now we represent the whole of the area so being a really active listener I had to do some studying up on things that I'd never heard of or done before because we aren't farmers some of the things are new to me completely like like leasing land and the tax recovery land sales and things like that. So I did some extra meetings so that I could catch up and called a few of my neighbors and just said, you know, what's your experience with that? So a lot of it was, um, yeah, like th that also understanding everyone's challenges and listening from like sort of a neutral perspective, but also the speed of business and, uh, and, you know, the dance that you have to do to navigate the things that are important to you and, and the, the patience that some of those managers have in the areas like they are tremendous professionals and they have a goal and they work so hard to get it. So I, it's, it was um, really remarkable to see people meet their, the objectives that they want to see in special areas, but how hard they have to work to get there and, and navigating that speed of business, which I think is the most frustrating part as a ratepayer is like change doesn't come quickly. As much as people think it should come quickly, it does not, particularly at the local level. Um, you, oh. you mentioned you, you've mentioned a word that I want to pick up on a little bit, and it's listening. Your role is to listen to everyone, the people who voted for you, the people who didn't vote for you, the people outside your community. If someone stops and talk, wants to talk to you about issues going on in the community, you, I'm assuming, will have to stop and talk to them. How important is it for you to listen to all sides of the issue, not just the ones that agree with you, but to the issues that you may not understand. So you have to look at both sides and have to talk to people who are on both sides of any issue. I think that's, <coughs> excuse me, the most important part, because like even, even when, um, mostly when you disagree, I find sometimes you don't know the whole side, like, or, or you don't understand the issue from a certain, like from a certain standpoint or a different level, like you're seeing it uh, from a different perspective. So I think though, and they're always the tricky ones too, right? They're always the issues that, that cause the most, um, the most emotion. So understanding where everyone's coming from at least gives you a better picture. And, and sometimes that's hard to do. Like I, I've grown a lot, even in my own, um, like even, you know, even having disagreements or arguments or conversations with people, I've come a long way to ask more questions than saying more things, right? So I try to ask more questions um, than. Do you feel comfortable asking things. questions now? Because I'm assuming when you, yeah. because when people get first elected, they're always concerned that they might be asking too many questions. And I, I, I find that with myself from time to time on my show is, am I asking too many questions? Am I letting the person speak as I literally just interrupted you <laughs> while you were talking? But do you find yourself feeling comfortable being able to say, you know what? I don't know. And I want to know before I make a decision. And I want to be uh, informed about what the information I'm voting on. Is it easier two years in to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to ask the potential stupid question that maybe other people don't feel comfortable asking. Yeah, I do. And I think part of it comes from me saying, you know, because I am only two years in, like you pointed out, like maybe there's some things I don't understand. You know, can someone give me the backstory or can someone explain you know more about this because like a lot of the things that go on in the areas might have been going on for like eight to ten or longer years right so so I don't mind asking questions but that could be the teacher in me too and the, the talker in me too so I don't have any problems talking which to the to my detriment or to my benefit I don't know but I did get very nervous there at RMA asking the question you I just did think an you're amazing in a job full of, <laughs> full of professional people and you're and I, you know, it, and he did catch me a little bit because I know there are grants and, but I know that it's not working. So I had to, I felt like it was one of those situations that if I'm here and I don't say or redirect my question, then I'll regret it. So I had to go again. Hey, sometimes if, you, 
you have to keep on asking the same question over and over again to get the answer you're looking for, <laughs> particularly yeah. with politicians who have been doing this for a lot longer than some of us have. Um, I, yes, I wanna... they are professionals in your field. <laughs> They certainly are. I want to ask one last question on the personal side, and then we'll talk about the special areas board as a whole. And I want to know about the personal public life of a counselor in a special areas board. Um, you have to make some very tough decisions around that council table. You are one of 12 people who have to sit there and make decisions that are going to affect people's day-to-day -day lives. And that means sometimes that could be negative. <laughs> And that means sometimes it's going to be tough to make those decisions, but you have to make them for the best of everyone. How do you balance your role as a advisory counselor on the special areas board with a just being Erica from time to time when you go out to your community and you just want to just go grab a carton of milk? I'm assuming there might be someone who might stop and say, hey, Erica, can we chat for 10 minutes? Do you get that? And how do you balance that lifestyle? in a community where you're not in Edmonton doing your job, you're not in Ottawa doing your job, you're in your community 24 seven, particularly even as a teacher. Yeah, well, I mean, sometimes those 10 minute grocery store chats are really valuable. And that might be the only time you run into that, that person. I know my neighbor and I, she's, oh, I run into her in the store and you get those quick 10 minute chats and you reconnect. And sometimes that's, that's the best time. I mean, it's not always ideal, but it just goes with, it goes with all of it. It goes, it went with my job before. That's not new to me, right? You run into somebody downtown and, um, Does and the family have understand the dynamics? To. Yes. Uh, my kids already think I talk too much. My husband knows I talk too much. So, you know, we're all, and then I remember even before my wife or before, we had kids that I had a friend and she's like, do, do you have a sign on your head that says talk to me? Cause I, I don't mind. I don't mind that. Like I, I welcome any conversation. And sometimes that's the only time you run into each other at the post office or wherever. So, do you so find it is people just engaged? Kind of part of that. Uh, you know what? Some people are very engaged. And then I find some people are really um, busy and, and not, not, and, and have a hard time feeling like they can be. I think it's overwhelming sometimes and and even before you know it can be really overwhelming right like the person it can feel sometimes like nothing is changing and everything is awful so sometimes I find in education and in government people say well I can't pay attention to that I don't know but it affects everything we do every every decision that is made affects us so I like to I don't know I like to share and talk about it so and people are like oh I'm glad you're telling me because I didn't know Sometimes. And that's, that's always the biggest part of it, right, is informing people. Um, I want to turn, because I'm very cautious of time, I want to turn to sort of the next segment. And that segment is about the special areas boards as a whole. But before I ask this question, I'm going to preface it as I always do. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is not a policy of counsel. Uh, the counselor who is sitting down with me is one of 12 people on a board who make decisions. She has one vote, so she cannot just direct counsel to do whatever she wants. So I've got to ask the sort of question to start this line is off. And that is, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you see as the biggest issue or issues facing the special areas boards today? I would say that the biggest issue, in my opinion, is the retention of workers and at every level, like we're talking mechanics, we're talking nurses, we're talking teachers. We're quite, quite lucky that we have three doctors, which is a fantastic thing, but um, the retention and, and recruitment of workers. And then with that comes the housing issue, right? Even if you can get them here, uh, it seems to be getting tougher and tougher to bring people to remote rural like you know we're rural but we're pretty darn remote none of our communities are over three thousand so it, the money is different right like yeah so it's a retention and recruitment of i would say any employees like we in right now you know had a nice we have a couple of restaurants but we had this one redone all lovely but couldn't find staff it's not operational they could not find staff to run it so staffing in our hospitals in our 
um, in our public sector, in our, all of it, in, it's everywhere. So everybody's struggling with that a little bit. So I, I've got to so. ask the sort of, what do we do about the issue? Because having an issue is one thing, but trying to address those issue mm -hmm. at the council table is something completely different. Now, I want to I want to stick with this yeah. retention and attraction of workers, because I think this is a big thing that I don't think a lot of municipalities understand that rural communities and rural and remote communities like the special area boards is facing. What do you see as your role in trying to address these issues? Is it just advocacy work or what is the council doing to ensure that you start trying to attract workers to the area? Part of it is growing your own too. I think that in this time of crisis, like we had a hospital closure, a lot of the organizations are saying, oh my, like we need to work together. So the areas, the school board, the hospital, like the can we need to work together. So how do we encourage kids to take that healthcare aid program in high school? How do we encourage kids to, you know, is there going to be, should we offer incentives? Like, I think that there's a bigger conversation going on now about, all right, how do we encourage kids to go off and get their education and come back? That's one thing. And then um, the housing stuff is tricky because that's a, not an easy quick fix, but the um, Acadia Foundation is working with the school board and, and they had some availability in their lodge and they uh, allow some teachers to live there. So like, you know, there's been a lot of working together to try to support each other through these these really kind of trickier times when it comes to housing because that's not a that's not a short-term fix so um you have people I think wanting to the, build in your communities though well, uh, yes and no like it's kind of like yeah the idea is there but what the tax it's tricky the town like into the town of Wayne for example has a smaller um industrial tax base they have mostly you know mostly homeowners paying the majority of the taxes which makes it tough so the incentive to build there is trickier um and that that's hoping to change you know they're there it's doing they're doing so much work they're trying to uh, move things up and get things going but again it's all a tiny thing so building there's been a lot of study like you know they take a look at what kind of housing we have what kind of housing we need and you know, there's ways to do it, but it's, 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 um, it's tricky to know what the right thing to do is. So there's been some getting together and looking at the housing and, and making some decisions and finding the right land for it too in town. So you, you talk about the residential tax base that the special areas has, and I can imagine particularly during these budget cycles where you have to make some very tough decisions because the cost of all do, cost of doing business is going through the roof right now, as you are aware. Uh, I'm assuming you go to the grocery store and you see cost of uh, groceries going up, cost oh. of gas is semi going down right now. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but usually it does during the winter times. But we are seeing an affordability crisis, and that means that the decisions you make at that table – are going to impact your residents. And you know that you don't want to sort of be a cause for people to potentially have to go without groceries or potentially uh, pay their taxes each year. But you know that you have to grow the community. You have to ensure that infrastructure stays soluble. Roads are paved. Roads are cleared. People are getting to where they need to go. How do you see council in balancing the good of the community with the good of the individual? Yeah, the, you know, the, the trick is always balancing the individual needs in, in and around the community needs, right? So I think it's really great that there's 12 of us at the table because the geographical region is, is large, right? And without that representation from each neighborhood, it would be hard to keep that balance. And and I do think I add sort of a different perspective. You know, we're not ranchers and farmers, but I am a part of the community that works in the public sector, but I live in special areas. So I am glad to be a part of that, but it is a balance, right? Like saying, you know, what, and I, I'm always glad for 
for good policy and well-written policy that that can help you and support you in there. Um, that doesn't always mean policy is good, but it does set set you up to be thoughtful about about each issue that comes forward. So it's not always in the in the favor of the rate payer, but at the same time, it's fair, and I think that's key. So you, you said on the Council of Twelve, and I, I did not prepare you for this question, but I want to ask it because I think it's a fascinating question I have to ask. You sit on the Council of Twelve. You represent, though, you were elected by the people of Special Areas 3, Ward 4, if I'm not mistaken, correct? I think you yeah. said that three times. But you are not there just to represent those people. You are there to represent the entire Special Areas Board. You have to make decisions based on everyone. How do you see your role as council in ensuring that your taxpayers, the ta taxpayers who voted for you, get their fair uh, worth of what they're paying in taxes? Because the issues that are up in uh, special areas two are not going to be the same in special areas three or special areas four, but you only have a limited supply of money that you have to sort of play with every year to make sure the community yeah. goes forward. So do you find yourself looking at every issue as a special areas board issue or a special areas three issue? You know, I probably uh, would, honestly, probably a special areas issue, a board issue, because I would say that the special areas does a really good job of, of, of being fair and consistent, right? And they have like long-term plans. They've got, you know, road plans so that everybody knows when their repairs are going to be done. And yeah, it might be three years away, but it's on the list and on the map. So I, you know, they work hard to try to be equitable. Um, I know sometimes I feel though we're on the very east side of the province that, you know, you're like the last stop before Saskatchewan, my neighborhood. So it's like, you don't know if we're getting mowed first or last. I don't know, but you know, so I am cognizant of of being on the edge. Sometimes you're like the last. I'll just rip out there later, but you know. <laughs> so most um, of the time, the board every once in a while, neighborhood number four. I, I want to sort of flip the question a little bit because I was accused of by uh, Councillor Cara Westerland of the RMA vice president slash Brazo <laughs> County of only talking about the negative issues of communities and never talking about the good things that happen in communities. So I've got to ask the sort of flip question to the issues that I asked earlier on, but what does special areas board do right what is the one thing that you boast about when you talk to your fellow counselors from across Alberta when you're at RMA and you say, we're doing it great out in the special areas board because we've got this going for us? What is that one issue? What is that boasting issue that you talk about all the time with your community? Well, I feel very lucky that, um, you know, our office administrators, like the, the people on the team of special areas, like those paid positions and those professionals in their fields are just phenomenal like so when I'm getting information I feel confident that it is well put together it's well organized and it's database like I am always in awe of the quality of information that we get and the level of data that they're tracking right so I'm always just saying that I'm comfortable making good decisions because I get the best information so I would argue special areas have a phenomenal team working in each of those neighborhoods because each um two and three and four have an office manager and then there's all those levels of just phenomenal brilliant people that give give the good information so that we can make good choices too so that's what i like to talk about awesome i, I want to turn to my last subject because i'm very cautious of time here and it's my favorite subject because i don't think it gets talked about enough in in alberta particularly at the municipal level let's talk tourism as someone who has gone through the Special Areas Board just recently, actually earlier this year, and I will be coming back later on in 2024 when I have to head off to Saskatchewan again, what are some of the tourist destinations in the Special Areas 3 or Special Areas Board as a whole that people, tourists, should visit? Well... I guess if you go from Calgary to Saskatoon and you need to take that 570 highway, there's that new Mossasaur exhibit there. 
uh, they put up, uh, they found the fossils, some fishermen found a fossil in Carrollside Dam and in about 2015. And so just this summer, they erected a big, uh, beautiful metal figurine, or not figurine, but like statue of this mosasaur. Uh, and it is to connect Drumheller with Dinosaur Provincial Park, the dinosaur trail there. So it's a great place to stop. Now, I think it was a regular stopping place there at Carrollside, but now there's a big dinosaur to stop and see. Um, Oyen, I mean, you can ask a lot of people, but Oyen has a phenomenal Chinese food restaurant and they have forever. I don't know why, but it's been here forever and it's always so good. And then along the way, there's all, there's lots of local little restaurants and shops and, you know, cute, like, and a lot of home-based businesses that are running out of, you know, our farmer's market is excellent. It runs June to September and concert has the market. So the farmer's markets are great because there's a lot of people making a lot of things. So, I, uh, I mean. So there's something you, for everyone. There, there is, there is. And, oh, you know what? Like Oyen has a baseball academy. So the bigger grades, 10 to 12, the boys come from all over the country to play ball here. And they get to play all over and hopefully get seen by some colleges in the state. So there's some, it's, that brings kids to the community. So that's pretty awesome. And uh, I don't know, there's just, there is something for everyone. Uh, where do you go? Multiple. Where do you, where do you go in the, in the special areas board? After a stressful day, of working as a teacher than working as a counselor long day of meetings where do you go to just decompress to let it all go to know that you have to make the decisions tomorrow the next day and the day after and that means that you're gonna have to just decompress where's that special spot for you in the uh, special areas well i mean i have four kids so most likely after all that i better get home so I it's it's home for me at this time of my life it has to be home because I've probably been away <laughs> and at meetings twice in the night so it's definitely home I, I have one last question for you and it's a very important question it's the million dollar question because I think every municipal leader whether you're a small town a rural community or a big urban center should be able to answer this question and I'm going to pose it to you oh. and you can take as long as you want to answer it. And that is in your opinion, what makes the special areas such a great place, a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Well, I think that living rural where my kids can hop out of my truck when I pull up at work and walk to their school. They can go uh, ride their bikes. I'll bring my bikes to the town. They can ride their, their bikes. Uh, the special areas, I just think it gives kids and families the opportunity to be passionate about their passions. Like the people that live here are passionate about their cows. They're passionate about their farm. They're passionate about the fields that they work in to support their farms. Um, and I think that the, the areas has the space and the supports and the resources to do that. And our kids get unique experiences that other kids don't get. Um, my niece is rolling from Calgary and they are just pumped to walk down to the store by themselves without you. Yep. Without you. Right. And they can buy their own thing. So it creates independence. It creates resiliency. It, it fosters all the skills that you need to go wherever you want in the future and make your own way but you build those skills right here. So I think the special areas gives you those opportunities. I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down on uh, an evening. We're recording this in the <laughs> evening and doing this. Uh, I can imagine after a long day, you just want to relax and kick back, but you taking time out of your busy schedule and with family to do this is very appreciative of me. So thank you so much, but also thank you so much for serving your community. I don't think municipal leaders hear that enough and I want to change that. So thank you for serving your community and thank you for making the tough decisions. I would not want to be in your shoes when you have to pass budgets and you have to make the decisions that pe affect people's lives. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, Chris, I really, you're welcome. And I really appreciate and I'm honored to be asked. So uh, thank you for having me. 
Thank you for asking good questions. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help continue us to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.